Corsair's Utility Engine, or Q for short, can be a pretty intimidating piece of software in terms of functionality, but regarding lighting customization and practical features, it's also a pretty beastly tool. Stick around for a solid minute and I'll do my best to teach you all I know about it. You can download Q from Corsair's site. I'll leave a link in the description for your convenience. Once you've got it downloaded, go ahead and install that bad boy. If you've ever installed anything at any point in time during your life before, this is a pretty straightforward process. Once that's all done and dusted, first go into the Settings tab up top, head over to the Device sub-tab, and Update Firmware. The latest version as of March 25, 2016 is 1.33. If the update went well, the status figure will say it works normally. If something happened to go all janky during the process, it will read malfunction. Should this happen to you, you can unplug your keyboard and try plugging it back in again. You can try reopening Q as an administrator, or you can try restarting your computer. Current layout depends on the type of key setup you want. I opt for North America because I live there. Polling rate I leave at 1000 Hz or 1 millisecond, and what this means is that the keyboard reports to the computer 1000 times every second, which is about once every millisecond. Setting it at 125 Hz means the keyboard will report back to the computer once every 8 milliseconds. 250 Hz equals 4 milliseconds, and so on. The math for figuring this out is pretty simple, but Good Guy Corsair has already listed that time for you next to the polling rates in the drop down box, so good on them. What's better? Well, generally speaking, you want a higher polling rate because that reduces the delay between the keystroke and the time the computer registers the command. The only big reason you'd want to lower it is to reduce resource usage. But most modern hardware should be able to handle at least 500 hertz without any issue, I would hope. Now that your firmware is updated, go over to Program tab and enable 16.8 million color mode, which you'll notice requires at least firmware version 1.2. You can also update the software here if you are so inclined and set particular program settings, such as loading it up on system startup. You can check default to standard lighting mode, which I will get into in a few moments, and automatically create application profiles stored on the device, or enable SDK, which is Software Development Kit. I choose not to enable this because it's for the smart people that know what they're doing and I have far too little self-esteem or brain power. On-screen display settings is fairly self-explanatory. You can check the preview box to show what the on-screen display would look like. You can set color and transparency for color and text or graphics, 0% being no transparency and 100% being completely invisible. And set the size of the display. You can invert the color of the text if you need to and enable or disable the timer name. Macro recording options allow you to select what options are enabled at default when you record your macros. And media players will show what players will work with your media slash function keys. You can add more players by clicking on add under actions. You can give that player a name and search for it with the ellipses button, or you can click Get Player by Window and click on the player on your desktop. You can also set the priority so if you have multiple players open, the keys will only be available for the topmost open media software. Reset messages means that if you clicked on a checkbox that says don't show this message again, all of those options will be returned to default so you can click them again if you get bored. Backup and Recover obviously backs up and recovers your settings respectively. Over in the Support tab, you have buttons that link you to various Corsair pages for the manual, support, help, forms, and their super secret X-rated site. Mmm, all the hardware. And then you've got a little section at the side where it shows you what kind of heat you're packing in your rig. Under the Lighting tab, you can create a new lighting effect or important ones you've downloaded online. Corsair's got a forum where users can upload their lighting profiles, so you can check that out. Link will be in the description. If you've got a super fancy lighting profile that you want to show everyone and their mother, you can export your profile and upload it to wherever you want as well. At the side, you have Solid, Gradient, Ripple, Wave, and Show All. And these are just for filtering your lighting profiles. Clicking on New allows you to create a new lighting scheme. Solid is fairly intuitive. Give your shiny new light a name. Right-click in the box and say Add. Since this is a solid color only, you'll get something that looks like this. You can right-click the bar that appears and edit the color. Right-clicking in the box and adding more colors is also an option. Clicking and dragging the little anchors on the sides of the color bar will determine how long the lights stay on the keyboard for and adjusting the top of the bar will increase or decrease the light's intensity. Towards the bottom of the box, you can choose to flip the order if you want, and you can also set the duration from anywhere between 1 and 10 seconds. Everything displayed in the box will play within whatever time frame you set. We'll just set this to 3 seconds for the sake of demonstration. Overall, brightness can be adjusted at the very bottom with the slider from values between 0 and 10. Then you can click OK, and your first solid lighting effect is done. If you want to see it in action, boogie over to the Profiles tab and click the Lighting sub-tab. At the bottom right, click the Advanced Settings button, then highlight a number of keys by clicking and dragging your mouse, or you can hold Control and click specific keys to highlight keys of your choice. If you know you'll be referring to those keys frequently, you can right-click them and say Add to Group. Then a window pops up where you can enter a name and notes for the aforementioned group. Once you click OK, you'll see that it's been added to towards the top of the window. When you click on that group, the keys you designated will be automatically highlighted for quick reference later. 
Click on the Lighting Effects List button and drag your lighting effect onto the group of keys you have highlighted, and it's as easy as that. Next, we'll take a quick look at the Gradient Effect. Go back into the Lighting tab, click New, select Gradient at the side, and give it a name that lets it know it's a unique individual or something. And then right-click in the box and go Add to create a color anchor. You can create a few more color anchor points if you are so inclined. And you can right-click and edit the colors just like how the solid effect worked. You can set the duration, flip the pattern, or adjust the brightness as per usual. And then to check it out, go back into Profiles, into Lighting, then highlight one or more keys. Then go into Lighting Effects and drag that sucker over. Up next, we'll observe the ripple effect. Go back into Lighting, give the New button a little love tap, and then select Ripple on the side and give that thing a saucy name or something. And then go ahead and add your colors. Here you see some familiar options and some new ones. Now you can check out Tail. This basically dictates how many lights will be active behind the first light of the ripple. Basically shows you how fat the thing is going to be. A value of 4 for the tail means the ripple will be 4 keys thick. Here there's a velocity setting. It's the same unit of measurement as the tail option, except this determines how many keys it jumps over per second. A value of 10 here means that in one second the light would have traveled 10 keys in any given direction. Go ahead and hit OK and let's test it out. Go back to Profiles, into Lighting, open Lighting Effects List, click and drag and... Oh, wait, what's this? We get an error. Well, I guess we'll come back to this in a few moments, but for now, let's go make sure Wave isn't feeling left out. Back into Lighting and then create a new Wave effect. Here you get similar options as with the Ripple effect, except now you have a little circle where you can adjust the degree at which the Wave attacks the keyboard. You can also determine whether it comes from one side or two. Don't bother going to the Profiles tab here, this effect is picky with key assignments just like its persnickety neighbor. If you only want to check out the standard lighting effects for the keyboard, you can scoot on over to my review of the keyboard here, linked on screen and in description for your convenience, for a full demo of each and every one of them. Now go over to Actions where you can import, export, and create a variety of everything. Go ahead and click on New and go to Macro. This is what I had imagined is the most commonly used. You can toss in a name and click on the Options drop-down menu. If you haven't set your defaults in the Settings tab, you can adjust your recording settings per macro here. Once you have your options set, go ahead and click record and do your worst. Really, it's okay, you can do your worst. I mean, you can adjust it when you're done. Now you can change delays by right-clicking and going to Edit Delay, where you can adjust it in increments of one millisecond or just change the delay entirely by throwing numbers in there. You can also tell it to use a random delay if you'd like. Right-clicking in your macro sequence also allows you to add events if you happen to miss a keystroke and even insert more delays if you choose. If you're impatient and you just want to get all your strokes in at once, you can click the Clear Delays button and hit OK. If you messed up the order of your macro, you can click and drag commands to match what you're envisioning. Should an impossible event happen, such as releasing key 2 before pressing it, for example, both actions will be highlighted in blue. If you want to get rid of an action, you can click it and give the Delete key a little tickle. Likewise, you can right-click and delete. Copying and pasting actions works as you'd expect, and you can select multiple actions by holding Control and clicking individual ones, by holding Shift and using the arrow keys, or by clicking and dragging in the window. Towards the bottom, you can check out the individual options for your macro. I'm going to hit OK for now and make my way to Profiles, then Assignments. Here you can right-click Keys and assign New Action where you'll see a familiar window, unless you've got the attention span and memory of a goldfish. You can also edit an action if there is one existing already, copy actions, paste actions, remap the key, or reset the key to default. There are also a few options regarding modes, which I will get into a little bit later, but for now let's talk about the action we created a minute ago. Click on the actions list on the bottom left, then drag your macro to a key of your choice. You can go ahead and test it out, along with the macro options within the editor menu. Execute macro uninterrupted works like so. This macro will go until it's darn well done and you can't do anything about it. Terminate when pressed again means that you're back in control, and if you press the key again, the macro will stop itself prematurely. Allow interruptions, then resume is exactly as it sounds, the macro will go, then you can throw in commands in between, and then the macro will continue where it left off. Cue next macro while executing means that the macro will finish itself, then the next macro will put itself on the chopping block for the next execution in line. Action repeat section has radio buttons for toggling, which executes the macro until you hit the key again, while pressed means the macro will keep going for as long as you're holding the designated key down, None obviously means there's no repeat, and repeat X many times means the keyboard will make you a sandwich. Delay between action repeats is fairly self-explanatory, it's basically adding a delay before the action gets abused again. You can add a constant delay, or a random delay within a range of your choosing, and at the very bottom you can see a Lighting When Start drop-down box. Do you remember our Ripple and Wave friends? Here's where they come out to play. 
Select any of your lighting effects and you can click the test button to see what it's going to look like. Once you're all dandy with your eye candy, whack that OK button and test it out. Go back to your Actions tab and click into New Action. Here we can look at text, which is like a simplified macro in a sense. You can give it a name, add some notes, and type in this big text box, and even add a delay between each character if you want. You can set a toggle so that the text will be repeated until you toggle the key off, or you can have the macro repeat as long as the key remains pressed. Or you can opt for no repeat at all, or you can hit repeat X amount of times for a cookie. Like the regular macro action, you can also set a delay between repeats. Text insertion method basically tells the function whether it's going to type each key manually or if it'll act like a copy pasta. And what's the difference, you might be asking, well, let's say you have a particular sentence written out each time, but people in your raid group are a little hard of hearing or something and that you need to yell that phrase multiple times. And telling it to act like a copy-paste means if you either toggle or hold the key down to repeat your text, it won't get cut off partway through when you decide to finally end it. Lastly, there's that lighting effect for when you start up the action. The next macro we can look at is keystroke. The similar settings apply, like, as per other functions, except this one is more for your standard keyboard shortcuts, kind of like, uh, Control c and Control v for copy and paste, except all that goodness in one little button. It supplies you a drop-down list for some common functions, but you can specify your own by typing directly into the box. The shortcut action is for program shortcuts, like hitting a button and opening up your favorite browser so you can go look for cat videos on YouTube, and it gives you some basic options, but then you can choose your own program if you so wish. The DPI action gives you a figure for your donkey punching index, where the more donkeys you hit, the higher your score gets. Just kidding. It's for adjusting the dots per inch on your mouse, which is significantly less exciting, but... You can set the DPI to a certain figure, where it allows for the individual control of X and Y axes in terms of mouse speed if you so choose, and you can even set up a sniper mode, where you'd lower your DPI to something easily controllable, and you can opt to move to the next highest or lowest DPI if you specify. Either option allows you to loop around to the default DPI after hitting the key enough times. Lighting effect is available for activation of the DPI swap. The timer is also fairly self-explanatory. You hit the button and a timer starts ticking. You can set the time in minutes and seconds, choose to restart the timer when the key is pressed again, and you can set up the sounds, lighting effects, or actions to trigger when the timer has completed. You can also set up a lighting effect for the beginning of the timer. The mouse action basically lets you bind a mouse click or the scroll wheel to a button on your keyboard, and I feel like that needs little to no explanation. If I have to elaborate on that, I think you may want a different keyboard. The media control functions allow you to control well, the media functions, and you combine the media keys to other keys if you don't like having them bunking up with your function keys up top. And now back to the modes that I was mentioning before. Go back to the Profiles tab and click the plus button under the Modes section. You can name this and add notes if it tickles your fancy. Now you'll notice that your new mode has been added to a list. It's basically a clean slate to work with. If you were working in the default mode before, you can click the little icon to the right of the mode name and adjust a number of things, including renaming, resetting, exporting, deleting, duplicating, and more. If you right-click a key, you can choose to have it select or switch modes, and you can also clone that key's function to every mode in that profile, so regardless of which mode you're in, that key will have the same job. These modes allow you to have a buttload of macros, functions, and lighting effects within one profile. For example, let's say you're an avid MMO gamer guy or girl, go to the icon next to your profile name and click Edit. You can change the name here, but probably more importantly, you can set this profile to trigger when a certain program is active. By the way, you can also adjust the on-screen display options when you click that little button on the bottom left of the window. Anyway, let's say you set the profile to activate when you run your favorite MMO, but you're like a really hardcore MMO dude, or dudette, with 42 diehard alts and another 66 characters dedicated for muling and farming or something. Well, with this one profile, you can set a different mode to use for each character instead of having one mode try to work for all of them. Let's say you play multiple MMOs or other games even, no problem. You can also have multiple profiles, and this happens dynamically. What that means is, if you open up your program of choice, the profile for that program will be loaded in. But if you alt-tab out, it'll go to whatever profile you had initially. So let's say I have a profile for, I don't know, Blade and Zola or something, and I just wanted to stay logged in to Camp Blackworm spawn or whatever. In the meantime, I want to play Fallout 4 or something. If I have a profile designated for each, the keyboard will dynamically change the profile as I tab back and forth in between the two. I can even set up a timer to count down for Blackworm spawn if I wanted. You can find a synchronized option at the bottom left for your Corsair peripherals. I do not have any, so I cannot test this, but basically if you have the Corsair headset and a Corsair gaming mouse with RGB capability, you can have them synchronized to each other, which is kind of neat. You can also delete, duplicate, and export profiles if you want to save them for later. Saving a profile to device memory means that wherever you bring this keyboard, that profile is the one it will always go to first, regardless of what computer you plug it into. A nice feature for gaming on the go, where maybe you end up using a buddy's PC or something.
And last but not least, setting a profile as the default will tell Q to load up this profile first, as soon as the utility engine opens up. Now that your keyboard has the world's ugliest color scheme, you better go fix it before a unicorn makes its way over and tries to sniff your butt. If you've made it to the end of the video, congratulations. You've earned yourself a hardcore gaming session with all your crazy new macro skills. If you learned something new from this video, please toss me a like and consider subscribing to my channel. It could help you and me both. If I left something out or explained something in such a way you didn't like or understand, feel free to dislike the video and leave me something in the comments. If you have any questions, I will try to clarify to the best of my ability. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.